uh, I'm going to introduce Craig today. Um, and it's sort of like having an old friend come over to your house, except he's in the computer <laughs> and not and sort of not here. So I've known Craig for a really long time. We worked together as part of the Connected Learning Research Network um, that Mimi was our fearless leader um, of for years and years. But um, Craig is going to talk today about a lot, a lot of the work he's more recent work he's been doing around artificial intelligence and racial justice. Um, and I, I talked to him a little bit earlier today and and heard a little bit of a story about how he came to do this work and the answer was really that there were seeds of it in the work all along um, and there was a new opportunity at ut austin which my guess is you'll talk a little bit about today um, to do some cross-disciplinary work with other folks at, at that university thinking about kind of um, ethics racial justice ai good systems those kinds of things so um, craig is the incoming Ernest a sharp centennial professor at ut at austin he, an internationally recognized expert in media, Craig is the author of six books exploring, exploring young people's engagement with media and technology. His two most recent books include The Digital Edge, which explores the changing contours of Black and Latino teens' media behaviors and Don't Knock the Hustle, which looks at how young creatives are using tech and social ingenuity to build a new innovation economy. Uh, Craig's also the founding director of the Institute for Media and Innovation, which is a new boutique hub for research and design, which is in the Moody College of Communication at UT. Um, IMI brings together a unique collection of social scientists, media creatives, journalists, and designers to translate research-driven knowledge into critical and creative engagement with media tech and AI-driven world, uh, an AI-driven world that grows more influential every day. Um, he's also the director of UT's Good Systems Racial Justice Research Focus Area. Um, and this is an area that brings together researchers, industry, and other stakeholders um, to explore ways that algorithmic fairness can be built into the automated decision-making systems that allocate critical resources and services to citizens and, consu and consumers. So I'm sure he's going to talk a lot about this work. Uh, I don't want to take up any more time. So Craig, a warm welcome. Um, after this session, Craig is going to stick around for another hour um, to chat and interact with the grad students. So um, stick around if you'd like to get a little bit more of Craig's time. So I'll hand it off to you, Craig. Welcome. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Katie. And um, thank you, Mimi, and uh, to the department for the invitation uh, to come and spend uh, this, this time with you. So, so Katie, it is kind of like a, like a, like a reunion of sorts, right? Uh, kind of coming back and I've seen uh, just some, some dear friends and colleagues who have had a, um, a lot of opportunities to have really interesting conversations with. Um, and a lot of the work that I'll talk about today, uh, in many respects, has been inspired by you know, those relationships and certainly uh, those conversations. So I'm going to share my screen and we'll get started. Can you see this sort of title screen there? Okay, good. So, um, so this talk is, uh, Katie noted, is based in part on uh, some work that I've been doing in earnest, uh, really for, for some time, but in terms of the, the focus on AI, I would say more within the last three to five years or so. And um, some things that have been happening both in my research uh, and then some things that have been happening at the University of Texas in terms of a, a greater emphasis uh, on artificial intelligence and trying to bring together uh, scholars in an interdisciplinary way uh, to look at uh, the kinds of questions that many people, in fact, around the world are asking about these systems uh, and their impact. And I'll talk a bit about you know, how, how, how that uh, sort of came about. But before doing that, I thought it might be useful just to give some of you a, a little bit of a background. So, so my, my work over the, the years of my academic career has focused primarily on this intersection between um, race and marginalization um, and uh, media and technology, particularly as it um, sort of is experienced uh, from, the, from the worldview of, of young people. And so I've always had this interest in how young people have sort of uh, mobilized around technology uh, to uh, grapple with uh, interesting questions around race, around inequality, around equity, around bias, uh, and sort of using uh, media technology uh, as a way to, uh, to sort of address those questions and fashion identities and experiences in a world in which 
uh, they oftentimes find uh, opportunity uh, waning. Um, that work uh, over the years has uh, certainly um, you know, encouraged me to, to sort of think about young people's migration to the digital world as, as we sort of know it today. They were really sort of early, early adopters of a lot of the platforms that we take for granted in our lives today, uh, social-based platforms, uh, community-based platforms, uh, video-based platforms. Uh, they've always sort of understood uh, the value of these systems uh, and the ways in which they can foster opportunities for identity, opportunities for community, uh, and opportunities for agency. And so I've always been sort of struck by that. Um, and you know, part of the, the work that we did with the Connected uh, you know, Research uh, Learning Network was really sort of focused on, on those questions. I think in my research, I, I focused a lot on issues uh, looking at race and uh, looking at equity. And in particular, right, what we were noticing around that time between 2010 and I guess 2016, 2017, when we were doing that work, really sort of the evolving sort of landscape of the digital divide. And, and we understood kind of going into that work that the digital divide was uh, way more than just simply access to technology uh, and that the divide was uh, e evolving in ways that were remarkable insofar as it spoke to the kind of ingenuity that Black and Latinx youth, for example, brought to their adoption uh, and engagement uh, with these technologies. And then in that work, I've also been thinking a lot about, um, you know, what it means for young people, sort of social, economic, technological transformation, and kind of the future of work and, and this whole kind of innovation economy that we find ourselves in, and sort of thinking about uh, the ways in which young people are trying to sort of navigate these currents, navigate the sort of precarity that they find themselves facing, uh, and sort of leveraging, um, you know, technology and other kinds of resources uh, as a way to do that. And so, so throughout all of this work, right, there's, there's been kind of this, this thread around, around race, around technology, around equity, uh, around transformation, uh, and sort of thinking about, you know, the, the technologies of the day sort of within that framework and certainly within that, that context. I would say as we began uh, to start wrapping up the work with the Connected Learning Research Network, issues related to artificial intelligence began to become more and more sort of prominent in terms of public discourse, kind of public recognition of the ways in which these systems were becoming more and more central to our lives. And, and, and I, I would argue that, that was primarily right a result of uh, the rise of you know, big tech companies, Facebook, big tech companies like Google, uh, Apple, and the ways in which they began to essentially sort of bet in Amazon, right, begin to bet their own future on what we now sort of recognize as AI or machine learning um, and there has certainly been an ongoing kind of interest and understanding of the, the sort of precarious nature of those systems uh, and what they mean for society, uh, and certainly what they mean uh, in terms of this, this context of this kind of racial justice uh, framework or lens uh, through which I want to sort of uh, frame a lot of my, my comments uh, today. As Katie mentioned, um, you know, I, about two years ago, I helped to create uh, the Institute for Media Innovation, um, and our focus is primarily um, like most academic institutes or centers, there's a, there's a research component where we try to look at and ask interesting questions uh, related to this intersection between media, technology, and innovation. Uh, a lot of that work uh, today is uh, you know, focusing on AI, uh, for example. Uh, but I always um, had the desire for, for the Institute to not only think about media, technology, and innovation or, or the future of media, but also to, to find a way to participate in, in sort of building that future, prototyping that future in small ways, of course, but, but sort of linking research to also trying to design and offer, right, what we think might be a solution or what we might think might uh, be a counter to some of the problems that we see uh, in the media systems and technologies uh, that, uh, that we experience today. And so we've, we've done, uh, I think starting in April of last year, as the pandemic was ramp, ramping up here in the United States, we began to start doing some research um, around COVID, in particular by right, doing a, a series of, of about 70 to 80 interviews or so with young adults in terms of how they were grappling with um, the COVID uh, condition, both from an economic perspective, but, but also from, from a health uh, perspective as well. And I'll talk a bit more about some of that work um, uh, as I sort of move through this, through this talk. Uh, and then sort of looking at some things around the future of work and mental health, which I'll, which I'll talk about as well. So, so this talk today is, and I'll move fairly quickly through these slides because I'm really just, I always like the, the questions and the, and the conversations uh, that ensue. 
but how do we design artificial intelligence to advance racial justice is kind of the, the, the question that I want to pose to you today, because it is in some ways, right, the question that resides at the center of a lot of my research activity today moving forward. And I'll give you a little bit of context for, for how that came, came to be. And I'll, I'll just give sort of a glimpse of three projects that the Institute is working on. Uh, one is looking at artificial intelligence and in particular um, AI de devices uh, rather uh, like Alexa, like Siri and their relationship to black and Latinx children. And the second project that I'll talk a little bit about uh, is some work on mental health that we've been doing. And then the third project uh, is uh, some work that we started last um, fall uh, and that work has uh, continued to evolve uh, with the city of Austin uh, in thinking about AI uh, through a racial justice uh, lens. So Katie mentioned uh, Good Systems and, and real quickly, uh, Good Systems is uh, a grand challenge uh, that was um, supported uh, by the president of the university about two or three years ago, that was Greg Finvis at the time. Uh, and then also the Office of Vice President uh, for Research uh, here on campus. And Good Systems uh, essentially uh, is, I think what, what many people would, would translate as ethical or res responsible um, artificial intelligence. But, but the challenge, right, was, was for uh, university uh, researchers and graduate students to uh, come across sort of their disciplinary lines or, or boundaries uh, and propose uh, research that might address uh, you know, issues around uh, AI and how we might think about ethical or artificial intelligence. And so the idea right, was in some ways is, is to create these sort of dynamic uh, teams. And what I mean by dynamic right, is sort of bringing people together who otherwise might never come together in conversation. People from information studies, uh, media, uh, health, natural science, engineering, computer science, uh, you name it, uh, and, and, and encouraging them to sort of think together, uh, think about research that they could do together, how their different disciplinary expertise might contribute to such a project uh, and then provide us some seed funding uh, for those projects to, to, to launch and then hopefully to find external funding uh, elsewhere. So Good Systems um, is, is sort of framed around, I would say three broad uh, kinds of research questions, uh, defining what is a good system. Uh, so we might ask for example, for example a good for who? Um, and um, you know, as simple as the word good, uh, you know, uh, seems to be, you know, I think in this conversation that, that many of us are having about these technologies, uh, you know, what is good AI, for example, or AI for good, it turns out, right, that, that what might seem so simple is extraordinarily complex. And there's just a lot of debate and tension around that word good. Uh, and so we try to grapple with it within the context of our work. Uh, another sort of, uh, sort of research framework uh, question is sort of how do you evaluate? A good system? What constitutes a good system? What are the metrics? What are the measures uh, for assessing and being able to make those kinds of determinations of whether or not a system sort of meets a certain standard that might qualify as good? And then finally, from a technical perspective, but also I think from an ethical perspective, you know, how do you build a good system? And so part of what um, the, the good system challenge did was it asked researchers to attend to these questions. It certainly addressing at least one and the projects that they were really interested in funding would figure out ways to address at least two, if not all three questions. Uh, and so uh, that just gives you a, a little bit of, a, of an orientation uh, in terms of what, what Good Systems uh, is, is attempting to do. Back in the, the, the late spring, early summer, um, Good Systems reached out to me uh, wanting to uh, sort of think about how uh, Good Systems might um, allocate some of its resources to sort of speak to this issue of systemic racism. This, of course, right, was in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor. Uh, and if you recall, right, the, the kind of mood in this country back in uh, May, uh, June of last year was pretty somber. And, and there was sort of a, a sort of, a, a sort of a traumatic awakening, right, for, for a lot of people, uh, including those that get systems, I guess, who wanted to I think more about these issues and, and sort of brought me in to kind of help uh, sort of begin to start thinking about what that might look like. One thing led to another and, and we essentially created a racial justice research focus area, uh, which was designed to really help get systems sort of figure out how to organize uh, projects to create a, a community both within the university, but also within the community to begin to start addressing these issues uh, in as substantive a way as, 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 substantive way as, as possible.
So uh, many of you are probably familiar, right, with, 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 with the literature uh, looking at, you know, systemic racism, structural racism, as it relates to AI, as it relates to machine learning, uh, you know, as it relates to, uh, you know, just the ways in which uh, these kinds of technologies are becoming more and more persistent. So we're thinking more and more about, uh, you know, the, 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 the work of people like Sophia Noble in terms of looking at algorithmic discrimination. Uh, you know, there have been a number of different experiments that people have conducted uh, that have began to sort of track the ways in which bias functions uh, in a lot of uh, these uh, uh, technology systems. Um, probably, you know, most, I wouldn't say most, but certainly a great deal of the attention has focused on sort of the, the deep and disturbing implications of what we might call a, you know, predictive policing and the ways in which, you know, that apparatus has embraced technology uh, in ways that uh, have generated a lot of concern, a lot of, a lot of tension uh, and raise a lot of questions uh, in communities around the, the, the country uh, and certainly around the world. Uh, and then, uh, you know, certainly just the, the failure of these systems to work for a variety of reasons, uh, biased data sets, um, sort of limited visions of how these technologies might be used. And sort of thinking, for example, about some of the, the, the problems that have emerged uh, with, with technologies like uh, facial recognition, for example. So, you know, this, this, this question about, um, you know, uh, how we begin to understand, uh, you know, these technology systems, you know, some refer to this as kind of the, the, the black box phenomenon, this idea, right, that, that we really have no idea about how uh, these algorithmic practices or functions uh, operate, right? This, this sort of notion of the black box is oftentimes um, used as a way to sort of speak to uh, the degree to which uh, a lot of these um, you know, actions are hidden, they're concealed, they're proprietary, uh, and we have no, no access to them. Uh, and that sort of you know, creates a situation, right, where there, there's no transparency, there's no accountability for the, the, the kinds of um, ill implications right, that these systems can and oftentimes uh, do uh, reproduce. Here's just a really interesting graphic, uh, you know, sort of looking at the, the, the unreliability you know, of facial recognition uh, and some of the, the, the problems and concerns that, that people have raised with the system that was, was being adopted, let's say, for example, by, by law enforcement uh, but, and used in ways that, that certainly, um, you know, render certain populations more vulnerable, right, to a false uh, match rate. And what you basically see here, right, is, is when you compare uh, Black women, Black men, and to some degree, white women to their white male counterparts, uh, the rate at which there's these sort of false matches being, ma being made. In other words, the facial recognition uh, a, a software uh, wrongly identifying them or wrongly matching them, again, sort of speaks to the kinds of racial blind spots that went into the very design of these systems, and perhaps more importantly, uh, the adoption and spread of these systems in sort of high stakes uh, institutions, uh, perhaps none more so than law enforcement. Some of you are probably familiar with, I think this is back in January of 2020, um, according to the New York Times, this um, young man from Detroit uh, was the first to be falsely arrested as a result of uh, 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 a bad mismatch of some facial uh, recognition software. Uh, and again, it was just uh, sort of a vivid illustration of a lot of the, the kinds of concerns and predictions that people have been making about software like this, about its failings, about its limitations, about the racist implications. Uh, and it has uh, hence caused a lot of departments, uh, finally, as a result of protests, uh, additional scrutiny to begin to either scale back, uh, create moratoriums, or, or no longer uh, use uh, these systems. And even tech companies, I think, like Amazon, Microsoft, and others have also kind of uh, suspended uh, their uh, decision to, to try and sell these systems uh, to various uh, potential uh, buyers. So these are just some of the core concepts. And, and what we might think of as sort of the, the ethical AI do, do, domain, um, issues around accountability, um, you know, this, this idea that, that, that when these systems make these kinds of mistakes, uh, when these systems practice discrimination uh, in the various ways in which we've seen racial, gender, sexual discrimination, for example, um, for, the, for the, the, the organizations or, or, or the technology companies that build and apply these systems, there's no real accountability for, uh, again, the sort of, um, sort of disparate impacts that, that these systems uh, can oftentimes uh, generate. Uh, again, no transparency uh, and trying to think about the ways in which these systems might be fair. Uh, 
there is this really interesting um, kind of kind of pushback against the notion of, of ethical AI that sort of informs the, the work that I wanted to, to give you um, a, a glimpse into today. Um, and, and some would argue, right, that the, that the ethical AI framework is, is just insufficient in terms of really beginning to deal with, with what's at core with these systems. And that is the problematic ways in which they are, are, are designed, uh, the limited context and frameworks and, and sort of values that go into, into the design, who's designing these systems, who's building these systems and who's using the systems. And so there is this, this recognition of the need to perhaps expand beyond ethical AI, in part, right, because of the ways in which you know, tech companies have embraced ethical AI, uh, if it's creating an ethical review board, uh, if it's uh, you know, publishing uh, you know, papers or creating these elaborate public facing websites that announce right there, attention to ethical AI, uh, it, it sort of leads to what, what, what some refer to as sort of kind of ethics washing. Right? And this, this idea uh, that in some ways, a lot of this is kind of, kind of virtue signaling without really sort of thinking deeply and in a, in a sustained and transformed way about what it means to, to really try to build these systems in ways that address the kinds of inequities uh, that more and more people understand that need to be addressed. And so it's this idea, right, of sort of thinking beyond the, the ethical question, right, code of conduct, you know, building systems that are good, nice, fair, um, neutral, uh, and this, this, this recognition of, of just acknowledging, right, the degree to which these systems have been and always will be a political, right, insofar as they are informed by a certain values. They inform by certain perspectives and views of the world. And all of this, right, of course, gets embedded into the frameworks and ways in which these systems are, are being built. We know, for example, uh, that these, uh, you know, technologies uh, are powerful, right? Because they, they, they allocate resources, right? They allocate opportunities, uh, they rank, they sort, they profile, uh, and they do this in ways, right, that privilege some at the expense of others. Uh, and so there's just this, this interesting call uh, to sort of demand, you know, that, that, that those who are designing and building these systems really begin to think in a much more intentional way about, you know, how uh, these systems can be engineered in ways that deliberately address uh, social problems. So uh, design this, that's critical, that is to say, that's, that's intended to, in some ways, uh, transform uh, inequitable systems as opposed to simply affirming uh, those, uh, those systems. Uh, and so it's this idea of, of AI, and, and I love this concept as, as political action, right? That when you are designing a system that has the kind of authority, power, and influence that these technologies do, it, it can, in fact, be considered uh, a political act. And when we begin to see powerful uh, institutions adopting these systems, uh, that case is made uh, in an even more stronger uh, way, I think. If it's cities, as I'll talk about later, police departments, uh, big tech organizations, uh, sort of recognizing right, that there is power here and how do we begin to attend to that power in a meaningful way. So let me just uh, talk real briefly about three projects that the Institute is working on. Uh, and then I'd like to just sort of open this up for a, a little bit of, of, of Q&A. So one of the first projects that, that I and uh, some of my collaborators from the School of Information at the University of Texas uh, pitched to Good Systems was looking at uh, the relationship that Black and Latinx children have with uh, AI devices. And, you know, this, this, this work was, was part of a, of a of a longer kind of trajectory of work that, that I've been doing, right? Again, sort of looking at the ways in which uh, youth of color um, sort of adopt uh, and use technologies in a variety of ways. Um, and sort of the recognition, right, that, that how we have historically thought about the digital divide that the, the tech rich and the tech poor has and have nots, that, that, those, that those frameworks in some ways, right, don't quite um, sort of uh, attend to, to, to the realities today. And so, so we were interested in sort of thinking about, right, as Black and Latinx children began to interact with these devices more and more frequently, you know, what are the, what are the potential implications of, of doing so? I, I was interested in this work, right, in, in part because I was familiar with some of the literature um, looking at uh, the, the lived experiences of, of young children of color. We know, for example, uh, that they're much more likely uh, than their white counterparts to be exposed to, to racial bias or racial discrimination. 
We know, for example, that their parents are much more likely to practice what, what some scholars refer to as racial socialization. That is to say, where they begin at a very early age to begin to start helping their, their children understand right, the implications of race, the consequences of race. Because as, we, as we've seen over the last you know, couple of years or so, uh, the, the stakes can, in, in fact, be, be, be quite high. Uh, you know, bodies are in danger, uh, lives are in danger. And so parents recognize the need to begin to start educating and socializing their kids around issues of race, around issues of inequality, uh, in some ways, right, as a way of, of protecting them and preparing them to deal with a, a, a oftentimes a hostile world. But we also knew, right, that, that as these systems, uh, as is always the case, as they're being created, they aren't necessarily created uh, for everybody, right? And, and, and that's not necessarily uh, intentional, that's not necessarily deliberate, but it sort of speaks to, right, this, this issue of the, the, the lack of diversity, right, within the tech sector. Um, and so as a result, right, just not even sort of thinking about certain issues, right, when the room is only populated with, with people with a certain worldview, a certain different experience, uh, you know, how technology might be used or how young children might think about these technologies, interact with these technologies, perhaps never come into the conversation, never come into the design process, and we wanted to sort of think about, uh, you know, through some interviews and observations with kids and their parents, you know, how are they interacting with these technologies? What, if anything, unique or different, right, do Black and Latinx children think about these devices? What, if anything, unique or different do they bring to these devices in terms of curiosities, in terms of dispositions, in terms of lived experiences, in terms of things that they expect of these devices to deliver to them? And, and so we sort of reviewed the liter some of the literature, right? And, and, and we know, right, that uh, you know, uh, people who have, have done similar kinds of things, either with AI or with machines or with you know, toys or robots, you know, these are just some interesting things that, that we've learned and sort of understood, right? Is that you know, some young children you know, think of AI as trustworthy, in some cases, even thinking of them as friends uh, or the ways in which they, um, you know, uh, but also develop some really interesting perspectives around. Um, using their own kind of language and sort of frameworks, which are very obviously very different cognitively than adults, but sort of understanding, right, the sort of the, the sort of creepiness factor, right, of some of these technologies, the ways in which they respond to you, or uh, the ways in which they make certain assumptions about who you are, or because a lot of these devices are trained basically to, to, to learn from the, from the data inputs, um, you know, how that might create, right, some, some unsettling uh, kinds of experiences with these devices. We also know, right, that, that big tech companies are increasingly targeting, uh, you know, children uh, through, the, through these devices. And so the, the home ecology or the home environment, right, plays a significant factor uh, in terms of how these devices are, are used by, by, by young children. So what we started doing, um, unfortunately, around January of last year, and it's unfortunate, right, because the, the work was disrupted by the pandemic, we were basically bringing uh, you know, uh, kids and, and their parents into a, a lab that we had on campus and letting them sort of play around with the devices, giving them some exercises and prompts to see how they might respond to, to uh, an Alexa uh, or, or some other you know, kind of device. And then also doing some, some follow-up interviews with, with, with the child and also uh, with the parent. That work uh, obviously came to, to a halt sort of into February, kind of early March of, of last year. And so we had to put the, put the project sort of, we had to suspend the project for a while and we've just now started doing some, some things virtually, uh, but as things began to open up, uh, you know, we, we received some extensions on the, on the funding uh, to continue doing this work uh, into the fall and, and maybe even early next year. But just to give you, give you one clue, right? So, so one of the interesting things that we heard from at least a couple of uh, kids was sort of a recognition of, of who builds these devices. Right. Instead of referring to, to whites, right, uh, as, as, as one young child put it, a sort of a recognition, right, that, that, that the individuals uh, who were building these systems or building this technology you know, don't look like me. Um, in this case, coming from a, a Spanish speaking home, uh, you know, probably don't speak the same language as I. And so just kind of a recognition that, that as a result of that, right, that there was maybe Right, some tension or some challenges or some things that they would have to uh, grapple with or navigate as they interacted with, with the device. Um, and I think we were, we were struck by the degree to which at least some kids were able to articulate right, a, an idea, a concept or a framework for thinking about this as something that was built. This is something that was engineered. This is something that was designed by someone who maybe has a worldview or lived experience that's different than mine. 
uh, and how might that, um, you know, sort of influence, you know, how uh, that young person might think about that device, connect to that device. Those are kind of some of the things that we wanted to explore and think about in, in that project. Um, it raises a, a lot of questions, right, in terms of, uh, as we think about kids and their relationship to these technologies, obviously issues around privacy. Uh, you know, when I was uh, finishing doing the research for, for the book, The Digital Edge, I, I in, in the, the final chapter, the conclusion, sort of trying to, trying to project forward and, and really thinking about, you know, the increasing importance of, of, of data literacy, for example, or AI literacy. Uh, and I would say that it was, you know, in part, right, you know, some of that work and the research that we had done, which again, sort of kind of propelled me to do some of the work that I'm doing today. Uh, and so those are uh, just some, some things that we're thinking about as it relates uh, to that particular project. The second project that I wanted to, to share with you is some work that we're doing around, around health and, and wellness. And uh, this, this project started in a very explicit way uh, back in early uh, 2019. But as I began to start kind of conceptualizing what I, what I thought I would like to try to attempt to do with this research project, it, it really forced me to think about just the, the trajectory of my work. Um, and what I began to understand is that oftentimes in, implicitly, I've, I've always had an interest in young people's wellness. So even when I was sort of thinking about and, and writing about hip hop and writing about black and Latinx youth and urban youth and sort of the ways in which they were adopting and using technology in really innovative and creative ways, there was always an implicit sort of, sort of wellness um, element or, or component there, right? Sort of recognizing that in some ways, adoption of this technology, articulation of an identity, um, the expression of oneself, the creation of a community was in some ways, right, about building and sustaining opportunities for wellness, right? Again, in the face of systemic racism, in the face of waning, and in some cases, virtually uh, no opportunity for, for mobility. And so, you know, it's, it's again, it's, it's always been there, uh, you know, sometimes a, a bit more ex ex explicitly, but I began in, in 2019 to, to really want to do some more, you know, kind of in the, the health and wellness space. And, and so we, we put together a, a design team and so we, we started doing interviews with um, mental health professionals, and we started doing interviews with young people who have sort of used, uh, a, a, let's say, a mental health app, for example, or turned to uh, you know, some other uh, you know, platform, technology platform, uh, to engage in some type of conversation around mental health. But I had also uh, sort of recognized kind of informally over the course of my research, because I've always sort of you know, tracked young people's, uh, what I call those sort of digital media and technology behaviors. And this is focused primarily, right, um, for example, on their adoption and use of social media. So just following, right, how they use social media, following uh, the conversations that they uh, have in the context of social media, hashtags, uh, influencers, and things of this nature, I started, started recognizing, and this is probably three, four, five years ago, conversations around mental health. Or conversations uh, around um, addressing mental health, defining mental health, understanding mental health. And it struck me, right, and, and, this, and this in part, right, was, was very much informed by the work that, that we were doing with the Connected Learning Research Network, is that we sort of understood in that work that we were doing, you know, the, the work that, that Katie alluded to, that, that Mimi was sort of leading in terms of our, our entire team, we always sort of, sort of knew and understood and, and, and tried to figure out ways to, to better understand how young people's sort of adoption of, of social media, for example, was, was far more complex than, than the, the public discourse was oftentimes making it out to be. Uh, in other words, right, this recognition, right, that, that they were understanding, right, that the potential of these technologies to serve them in ways that were meaningful, to serve them in ways that attended to the things that they cared about or the things that they were interested in. And it, it began to, I began to just start seeing that in terms of the mental health conversation and the mental health space as well. And so for me, it was, it was a project that I wanted to do um, that in some ways was about, you know, you know, young people are already doing this, right? So we obviously, since COVID, you know, there's, there's been a lot about telehealth and a lot about the ways in which mental health services, for example, are now being delivered, uh, you know, via a smartphone, being delivered via, a, via a, a, a computer screen. But the reality is, right, as, as has been the case in so many other instances, 
young people were kind of early adopters of this, right? They were already recognizing that these services could be used in that way. If you look at some of the research that Vicki Rideout and Susanna Fox, for example, did, where they, I think they did a survey looking specifically at young people's social media, digital media, and their health and wellness behaviors, right? This, this, this recognition or notion that they already understood the capacity of these technologies to provide them with those kinds of resources. So anyway, it was, it's sort of within that sort of, sort of framework that I began to start thinking about this project more specifically. And we know, right, with, 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 with COVID, the, the mental health crises, which was already kind of underway before COVID, has only accelerated and, and intensified. So we're seeing higher numbers of younger people reporting uh, you know, concerns uh, about mental health. Uh, youth of color, for example, essential workers, uh, certainly. Uh, and so this is the work that we've, we've been thinking about. Uh, a lot of barriers to why uh, young people, particularly young people of color, uh, oftentimes don't seek out uh, mental health services. And it has to do right with, with, with stigma. It has to do with not quite understanding what's happening. Also their financial and sort of economic reasons as well. But what I wanted to, to say just in terms of the, the project that we've been developing. So after doing all of that research for about nine to 10 months or so, the team, I would say in the latter part of 2019 and then through the much of, of 2020, essentially prototyped a, 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 a digital, um, tool or digital platform. Um, and I, I won't go into the, into the details, but it, it was after talking to, to stakeholders in the space, mental health care service providers, those who are also seeking help and seeking support, we were trying to think about, you know, what might be a really interesting or novel kind of technological solution. And in particular, right, how do we sort of design this in ways that might appeal to people who otherwise might be a little bit more distant, uncertain, or anxious about uh, this kind of care because of, let's say, for instance, uh, you know, incompetent care or, or systemically racist care. Um, and so you know, trying to, to, to design a system where um, as uh, people were using it, uh, being able to, to analyze a language and to, to understand uh, you know, sentiment, for example. So could you engineer or design uh, you know, a, a technology or model that might allow us to, to be able to do that? Um, sort of thinking about the ways in which uh, the system might allow, let's say, a, a peer specialist or, or, um, or, or a therapist uh, to sort of work with the client or to work with the patient uh, and to be able to have access to information, access to data that maybe is generated by the client, generated by the patient, uh, and then is shared with the, uh, with, with the care provider uh, in ways that might allow for them to uh, sort of essentially craft uh, a, a, a more a suitable and, uh, and customized path to health and wellness. Uh, and then trying to think about, you know, what kind of data sets right, might be used to bolster and build these systems and how might those data sets be more, more, more culturally uh, proficient or, or culturally relevant? Again, sort of thinking about uh, a lot of the sort of historical legacies uh, that have made these systems in some ways inhospitable uh, to people of color. There are obviously right, a lot of challenges uh, in, in doing this kind of work. Um, you know, there, there are ethical uh, questions to be raised. Um, uh, certainly, um, how do you sort of deal with, uh, you know, the, the, the rampant rise of misinformation? In other words, you know, creating a system right, where people can feel safe and, and be safe uh, and know that the information that they have access to is credible. The information that they have access to, have access to is trustworthy, is scientifically backed. Uh, and certainly in, in a world of misinformation, disinformation, we understand right, that designing systems that are able to create those kinds of platforms and experiences uh, apparently right, isn't, isn't very easy to do. Uh, and again, sort of thinking about just the systemic racism in psychiatry, uh, that is oftentimes, uh, I think, uh, diminished uh, the, the capacity, uh, you know, of this uh, profession to deliver uh, to people of color in a compelling way. And so I'm happy to talk more uh, about this project, but, but again, you know, trying to go from research to actually designing and building something uh, that might actually be used in the world is something that we are interested in uh, and are preparing uh, to do. And then finally, let me just uh, speak really quickly about the work that, we, that we're doing with the city of Austin, which actually started around the, the latter part of the summer, early fall of last year. It too sort of inspired by uh, the sort of growing kind of awareness uh, and concerns uh, about systemic racism. Uh, basically what we approached the city uh, with is, is this question of, as it begins to sort of think about the technology systems that it, it adopts, the ways in which it's increasingly beginning to think about and in some cases use um, AI-based systems, 
uh, what are the, the, the racial uh, equity implications of those systems? And to what degree are they designing strategy? To what degree are they creating uh, a lens through which, a racial equity lens through which they can look at and better understand uh, the extent to which these systems may be replicating historical biases, inequalities, uh, and disparate impacts. Um, we know that, uh, you know, since, in some meetings that we've had with, with some, some um, uh, city leaders and, and researchers from, from other cities, uh, San Antonio, Los Angeles, uh, New York City, for example, we know that more and more cities are beginning to uh, adopt and, and integrate these systems into their operations for a variety of reasons, right? In, in some ways, right, the, the perception that, that many uh, organizations or businesses have, and that is that these systems can lead to greater efficiencies, right? Uh, being able to, to do more work with, with, with less human labor. Um, obviously, right, the, the, the scale of the kinds of data that, that city governments are operating with suggests to them, right, that any system that can help them manage that data, curate that data, organize that data, process that data, and make decisions with that data is something that they're very open to uh, and certainly uh, you know, willing to, to try. And in some cases, right, there's even the, the view that, that using these systems can, in fact, reduce a human bias uh, and uh, allowing machines to make decisions uh, presumably right through a much more neutral lens, and we, we all know how problematic you know, that can certainly be. I think, you know, when, when, when most people think about, you know, cities and technology and AI, I think that the sort of obvious, you know, candidate is, is the, the rise of predictive policing uh, for, 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 for notable reasons. But it turns out, right, that, that, that cities like, like Austin are you know, using these systems uh, to address all kinds of issues. Uh, and these systems are, are cutting across all kinds of departments, transportation, um, housing, and planning. And of course, uh, like so many other cities in this country and around the world, thinking about public health and, and more specifically, right, uh, I mean, Austin, uh, for example, you know, uh, I think by late spring, certainly by early summer, had built a chatbot, right, as a way to help it sort of deal with the with the pandemic as it was beginning to reach its, its sort of crisis point here uh, and elsewhere. Our work with the city is is as of now is sort of focusing on, on four domains, and this work is just really in earnest started uh, this year. Uh, and this is work that, as we work with the city, we're kind of projecting will 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 we'll, we'll take you know some time to do in terms of realizing our 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 full vision for this work. And that is really helping the city devise a blueprint, a strategy, uh, what we call a, a kind of tech e equity a toolkit uh, that it might be able to, to use or that departments might be able to use to be much more intentional about how they understand the potential uh, impacts, uh, disparate impacts that these systems might have. So we're sort of helping them to begin creating a process to help them think about procurement. That is, how do you design like just a system where you just quite simply, you don't purchase right, technologies that are biased. You don't purchase technologies that have been trained and built on biased data sets. Uh, perhaps not too surprisingly, you know, those issues uh, rarely, if ever, occur in the conversations that those who are making decisions about which systems to buy um, rarely if, if, if ever have. Uh, we're also talking with them about just, you know, how they think about data, how they think about their operations, how they think about day-to-day -day practice and how these systems are kind of incorporated into those practices and how do they begin to think more strategically about the implications of those practices. Again, particularly through a racial equity, sort of racial justice lens and, and framework. Uh, and then finally, something that we think is, is absolutely important here and, and and this is, you know, research that, that, that others are doing that I find just, just really critical. And that is, you know, trying to sort of figure out, right, what is the role of, of community stakeholders in terms of the kinds of conversations, the kinds of decisions that cities are making about how these technologies will be both adopted and deployed. Um, and I like to say, and, and I say to, to, to the folks in, in, in the city that we've been meeting with and working with, is that I, I, if we're successful, right, and if other people who are doing similar work are success, successful here in this country and around the world, in three to five years, right, most cities will understand, right, that it's, it's simply improper, right, to make a, a, a major decision about some kind of technology that you want to uh, procure and then use in a way uh, that potentially might have disparate impacts on, on certain populations without having engaged those communities, without having engaged those populations about those systems. In other words, to what extent will communities begin to have voice, agency, 
uh, some degree of, of say and influence in terms of how these systems are operating. I think right, this conversation around data rights, this conversation around uh, how do we begin to create a much more AI and, and data literate uh, citizenry uh, is something that's going to become even more and more important. And we hope that as we begin to develop this framework and this work with the city, we'll build in a component uh, that allows us to, to, to sort of operationalize that in ways that might be effective uh, and, uh, and partner and model uh, with other cities who are doing a similar uh, kind of work. So I'll stop there uh, and uh, happy to, to answer any questions or if you have any thoughts about uh, any of the projects or any of the work that we're doing, uh, very happy to, uh, to hear more about that. Awesome, thanks, Craig. So I think Maria did have a question partway through your presentation. So Maria, maybe, uh, do you remember the context that you asked that question? She wanted, it, it was about your use of the term transparency and whether by the word term transparency, you meant explainable AI, but I can't remember now where kind of what, what that was in reference to Maria. I don't know if you remember, or Craig, do you know, in your own mind, you know what, what the slide that was? Yeah. Um, it may have been the, where I showed the black, maybe the black box, um, and uh, this, this idea of, of the sort of the secret or hidden or concealed nature in which these systems make decisions. Um, and so, yeah, I, so I, I think that the, the literature on transparency is, you know, is, is, is certainly growing. And some of that, right, uh, you know, can be interpreted as, as explainable AI. I think some of it is, uh, you know, uh, this, this idea that, um, you know the the need for um, for people to understand, right? You know how 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 decisions get made, uh, particularly right. You know decisions that, that are high stakes. Uh, you know uh, you you get rejected for a job, or you get rejected for a loan, or you get rejected for for something else, right? That that has real consequences in terms of life chances, uh, and the idea, right, that that we have no way of knowing, right, how that decision was made, how you were evaluated or assessed, and how that output was rendered. Uh, and there's this, this view of this recognition, right, that these systems, uh, in order to, to address and be sensitive to those kinds of concerns, uh, need to be and should be uh, much more uh, transparent. Particularly, right, if, if you're thinking about, uh, you know, a public, um, you know, institutions, right, that, that, are, that are using these kinds of technologies and, and basing decisions on that. So cities, for example, local governments, for example, uh, we know that, that, that you know, you know, corporations and, and big tech companies, uh, you know, oftentimes make the claim, right, that the algorithms are, are, are proprietary and that the, the, the trade secrets, um, but, you know, there, there certainly, you know, have to be, I think, you know, some, some we have to reconcile, right, you know, those, those issues with, with, with the need in some ways to, to better understand, uh, you know, again, you know, how these systems render their, their decisions and how those decisions impact people's lives. All right, if you guys have a question, can you put a plus in chat and I can kind of call on you so I know, or you can wave your hand wildly so I can see you on video. Surely you must have some questions. All right, Roderick, thank you. Maybe uh, I'm I, No, I think I was just taking a long time to do it. <laughs> My, um, my Zoom skills have not improved in any way in the past year. Um, hi, Professor Watkins, it's nice to meet you. Um, I've read your work a lot, but we've never actually met. And I really enjoyed your talk, thanks. Um, I have questions about digital inequality, and I also have questions about public AI. Do you have a preference for either question? Uh, no, you, whichever question you want to leave with, I'm happy to respond to. Okay, sure. So I guess what I'm thinking about is digital inequality. And so I noticed that that was a term that you had used in, in kind of earlier work. Um, I have one student, um, Neka, who is not here. She's been working on and kind of um, doing a sort of a, a systematic lit review about digital inequality for the past year. And I guess one thing I'm thinking about is, could do you relate the work that you're doing uh, in terms of public uses of artificial intelligence to the work that you did in digital inequality? I guess, is there is there some connection that needs to be or could be sort of articulated there? Yes, it's a it's a good question. I, I and I do think that there I, I do think that there certainly are are connections, and it would be really interesting to sort of think about what, what those connections are. 
So, so of course, right, how, how we define digital inequality rights can, can certainly vary. And, and, and some of the work that I've done, you know, we've, we've tried to kind of, kind of map that out or, or, or render that, you know, more, 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 more complex than it might, might otherwise seem. And so, you know, digital inequality could, you know, relate to everything from, you know, access to, to, to technologies, um, Knowledge about understanding of technologies, uh, different different practices you know, related to technologies, um, social networks, uh, you know the, the, the connections and communities that we're embedded in, and, and how just the flow of information, expertise, insight, knowledge certainly kind of informs and enhances the, how we might um, sort of uh, uh, practice uh, certain kinds of digital skills or behaviors. And so I would say that that all of those things, right, are, are or at least, uh, if not ex explicitly, you know, connected to these sort of public uses of, of AI, for example, I think that they're certainly implied, right, in terms of, this, this, just take literacy, right, in terms of sort of understanding, right, <laughs> these systems, uh, understanding how they function, understanding how they operate, um, understanding, right, both the ethical, political, social uh, sort of implications and impacts of the system suggests, right, that there's, there's some linkage there uh, in terms of uh, you know, how we might think about digital inequality uh, and then these sort of you know, public uh, uses of, of AI, uh, for example. Is that kind of what you were thinking? Well, yeah, I guess I see a kind of gap there. So <laughs> um, digital inequality is, um, like you said, it's, it's a little bit slippery, right? So it, it tends to kind of move around and so, uh, I was also thinking about these kind of like public uses, and I was thinking one way in which they are con connected does seem to be that there is an implied kind of normative aspect that both in digital inequality work and then like you were talking about these kind of city agencies, this kind of pressure that they feel to become kind of data driven or to, to use artificial intelligence. I guess one obvious, my mind kind of went to normative and sort of coercive aspects of these concepts more than and also kind of presumed deficiencies right yeah no i think i think i think that's that's certainly a, a good way of, of thinking about it and, and framing it um you know one one thing that struck me about what we're learning from you know our conversations with the city and, and some conversations that we've had with, with with people in other cities as well is The degree to which these systems are, are, are gradually being adopted more and more without a real sort of adequate uh, understanding of kind of what's at stake or, or even sort of, you know, asking questions, you know, related to some of the things that I've talked about here and certain things that, that other people talk about in terms of bias, in terms of you know, the, the failure or unreliability of these systems in terms of disparate impacts, uh, in terms of, you know, thinking about uh, the kinds of historical biases or, or, or data set biases that go into these systems. Um, I mean, you know, the, the, the idea that, that, that cities would be invested in these kinds of technologies without really thinking in any robust or meaningful way about this, you know, suggests, right, that, um, that, that these kinds of literacies or understanding or, or knowledge of these uh, technologies, it's not just kids, right, who don't get what these systems are about and what they do, but it's, it's professionals and adults who, who are in you know, pretty, pretty high decision-making and, and, and authority-driven uh, spaces, you know, also oftentimes bring uh, little of any understanding to some of these issues in any depth way. All right, other questions. We have about two minutes, so maybe we have time for. Oh, unless Craig, did you have something? Else? I, see, I see Ellen with her, Elin, or E L E N. All right, great. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, you, you've said uh, with uh, Rodri questions, you've said uh, a lot, but uh, um, you answered already a lot. But I would like to, to put to you this question about. Uh, we have in one side the inclusion, which is like uh, um, when you said like the, the, the kids, uh, uh, they ask uh, who are making these systems. Mm -hmm. So the people who are making these systems are more 
let's say, white. Uh, and I would like to extend the, the white concept to uh, white epistemology in a way that uh, uh, when there, I, I saw some, some studies about this, people start to question is, once you include people, uh, how uh, are you questioning how those systems are built what are the knowledge embedded on it and how we can really um, make effective change and not just like because you include people uh, but there are some standards and expectations which already exclude some people with different backgrounds and types of thought yes um so I yeah I, I, I definitely agree with 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 what you just articulated. Um, I, I'm not quite sure I, I got the question, or was it was it a question or just more of a more of a comment? I'd like to to hear from you. How do you see this? Uh, and for your research, uh, how do you see like people who are being included, like people of color, different types of people? How they are building these systems? If they are, if you, if, if they are doing the same thing, we yeah. will not have a good outcome either. Because so how how they are embed, embedding like put inside the systems all this questioning that make prejudice yeah. that makes prejudice. So 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 I guess partly if I understand your question is if we start you know creating you know design teams. Uh, you know that are that are more inclusive. You know, engineering teams that, that are more more inclusive in terms of race, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of gender, in terms of language, in terms of sexuality. Um, you know, what 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 are the prospects then for for perhaps um, you know creating uh, technologies that um, that are that are more aware of and, and, and sensitive to some of the issues that, that that we've been discussing here? Is that is that kind of the, the question that you were? I, I'm going to interpret your question that way, um, and and what I understand you to say is, um, you know, what's what's the likelihood, right, that um, that just because you have a team that's that's racially and ethnically diverse or diverse in terms of gender, what's the what's the likelihood that you that you that you get different different visions of what what these products could be and what these products could could do in the world. Um, I, th I think that's that's a fair question, right? That that we we can't simply make essentialized assumptions about someone just because of of a, of a racial or, or ethnic you know identity that that would automatically translate right into designing something that's fundamentally different than, than perhaps what we what we see today. Um, and so, what kind of orientation? What kinds of values? What kinds of principles? Again, um, you know, what vision do people bring to these technologies? I, I do think right that there is something about lived experience. And as a result of lived experience, right, it, it, it suggests, right, that the way in which you look at the world, you see the world, you understand the world, you imagine the world, or you aspire the world to be, that, that you know, when you, when you have people who are, who are included in these processes, who bring different lived experiences, that it, that it does, I think, uh, sort of increase the chances that they'll bring different questions, that they'll bring different priorities. Uh, that they'll bring different kinds of awareness and, and, and knowledge uh, that might uh, ultimately, uh, you know, influence a design process that might lead to a product and experience a world that's very different than what we've experienced to date. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So, Craig, thank you so much. Um, I, so that we're uh, kind of at the top of the hour right now. So what I'd like to do is thank everybody for coming. First of all, it was fantastic audience. And uh, Craig, again, thanks so much for your time. And then um, Michelle is going to be the host for the next hour with the grad students. And I think I'll, I'll let you set the norms, Michelle, how you want to um, have people do Q&A with Craig. So, um, but I have to hop off because I have another meeting, uh, but it was really great to see you and it was, it's wonderful work. Thanks so much. Let's give a round of applause. Round of applause. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Watkins and Professor Watkins for, for, for staying a little bit longer with us, the, the students and a couple of the staff members. So let's, uh, if anybody has uh, any questions, if you don't mind just raising your hand and I will I will give you an, an unmute and, and then just feel free to, to ask any questions about Professor Watkins' uh, 
pres uh, presentation. Okay, M Maria, yeah, would you mind? Hi, uh, yeah, thank you so much for your work and everything. Oh, the camera's not working right now, but <laughs> thank you so much for this presentation and um, everything that, well, that you're doing. Um, I just had a question mostly about your point of view on certain like topics. I'm not sure how to phrase this, but I'll try. Um, how, like, how do you see education and AI relating this to like the last part of your presentation, um, working alongside like with your research? Do you have any recommendations or a, or where do you see it going or more like with your research? Um, have you found some necessary lines in AI work? Oh, hi, now I'm here. <laughs> um, this comes because I'm doing AI in education too uh, with a social justice lens. So um, I, I'm kind of seeing like how to incorporate topics like AI bias and um, a fairness and all of these topics in a more down to earth, like uh, way with communities and marginalized youth. So how do you view education like as a, I'm not sure if I'm making any sense. <laughs> There's a lot and, going on. And, and, and do you mean how, it, in terms of how do we design education in ways that, that help people develop uh, a better sort of deeper understanding of these of these technologies or or how yeah. so so that's 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 one way of thinking about the education component, right? In other words, how do we how do we promote and cultivate greater AI data digital literacy? Um, or are you thinking about you know how do we use AI, for example, in education to improve or to enhance education. So one is really about how do we teach people to, to sort of be much more aware and to think critically about AI. The other one might be how do you design or engineer AI to perhaps deal with some of the, 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 the challenges that we see in education today? Um, could you use technology to make learning more customizable? Could you use technology to identify you know, where students are perhaps weak or strong, and then you design curriculum or design opportunities to address those strengths and weaknesses using, uh, you know, this, this, this data uh, that you might have access to to help you make those kinds of term determinations. So it, does that make sense, right? So, so there are many different ways in which the AI and yeah. education conversation come together. And I'm, I'm just wondering which, which framework are you thinking about? Yeah, I think, I was thinking about all of them at the same time, so sorry for the confusion. Um, I think I want to start with the big, what is the role, like, what would be the goal in your experience of education in AI um, relating to the communities and the, like marginalized communities? Yeah, I would say, um, and again, I'm sorry to, 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 to do this, but so when you say education, are you, do you mean not necessarily school, right? But just education in terms of just knowledge. Yeah, like use of AI literacy and AI citizenship more like in that right. way okay. of right. acquiring yeah, knowledge. Just, yeah. Because sometimes education you can it's, it's like oh school, right? And and AI. Yeah. Yeah. No, you, it doesn't seem like that's what you're asking. So I just wanted to get that clarification. Um, I mean, I I I I'm proposing right, and some of the work that we're trying to do and to get funded. I'm proposing, for example, that we should begin to start thinking about creating community spaces where uh, there can be opportunities for uh, members of the community to uh, grow and build their knowledge and understanding of, let's say, artificial intelligence, for example. Um, you know, if it's through, you know, workshops, if it's through uh, you know, forums, if it's through events, uh, but things that are, that, are, that are based, you know, within a community, therefore they're accessible to people within the community, to begin to start creating opportunities, begin to start creating forums and spaces for them to talk about these issues, right? In, in some cases, 
whom they have formulated ideas and opinions that they want to share and there maybe aren't any um, you know, designated spaces to share that in a, in a collective way. Um, in other cases, right, they, they may not necessarily have, have the language or understanding, but uh, nevertheless, they still may be interested or certainly understand that, that they should perhaps uh, have more knowledge about these systems. But I, I, I think, right, figuring out ways to foster, you know, opportunities for, for communities to come together, for communities to, um, you know, um, in a lot of cities, you're beginning to see, let's say in the case of like city leaders or city departments, beginning to have um, you know, public forums and um, opportunities for the community to come and have uh, you know, public comment or open comment on you know, whether or not the police should use drones, for example. We just had a conversation like that here in Austin where, where people came together uh, and they had a chance to sort of share their thoughts people that are from the community had a chance to share their thoughts, their concerns, their anxieties about the city using drones, where they're using those drones, how they're using those drones, what they're using those drones for. Um, and you could, you could argue, right, that, 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 that opportunity to have that conversation, that opportunity to make public comment is an opportunity for the community to start building uh, you know, uh, platforms for education, for growing knowledge and growing further understanding of these systems and what's at stake. Thank you so much.